Well, I am a former Liberty player, Swin Cash, and I'm happy to host this wonderful panel today. Uh, this panel is Priceless Memories, presented by the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. It's going to explore the early days of the WNBA through the lens of key stakeholders, and I think we have a lot of key stakeholders up here, don't you think? Yeah. I think we do. So we're going to kick this off right now by introducing everyone. Right here to my left, we have the lovely Kim Hansen. We also have the first, first commissioner of the WNBA, Ms. Val Ackerman. Next up, we have the gentleman that's in between all of us from the Basketball Hall of Fame, the Day Smith Basketball Hall of Fame, Matt Zizing, correct? Yes. Another Liberty legend we have, the one, the only, Miss Sue Wiz. And at the end, the lady that loved to give me some of those elbows early on in my career, Miss Tamika Whitmore. All right, so we're gonna get to the memorabilia that's behind us, but Val, why don't you set the tone for us? I mean, it's 25 years, WNBA. I don't know if you ever imagined that we would get to this point when you were in that office fighting with David Stern of how this thing was gonna get off the ground. Can you give some perspective to where we are now, but how it all kind of came about? Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, um, well, first of all, it's an honor to be here. So Kia. Clark. Thank you for everything you do yes. and for having, having us here today. Um, I, I just, you know, for someone like me who was there with some of my colleagues at the beginning, um, hard to believe it's been 25 years that uh, this great league came into being and this great franchise, New York Liberty. Um, I, I just quest, anybody, any of you there in the first season? Look at this. Oh, that's a that. round of applause right that's there. That's incredible. Thank you. Woo! I mean, um, you know, Swin, I have just incredible memories of those early years, those first games, Maddie um, hopping around, um, the atmosphere at the Garden, and it was really made possible, most of all, because of these great players. Um, you know, the league was, there was a lot of work to get it up and going. Um, there was, you know, a lot of support by a lot of important people who made it possible. Um, I, you know, I just want to pay homage to David Stern, the longtime commissioner of the NBA. He gets every bit of credit that you might um, the expect to the for saying there will be a WNBA someday. And it was an honor, just the highest honor for me to be able to work with him and, um, you know, be part of that incredible group effort that, that made this league happen. So for me, um, I, I sort of have tears in my eyes, Swin really sort of being here and seeing what the league has become and this generation of players. I mean, we had great ones. We had great ones. Um, but to see the sort of, you know, the changing of the guard, seeing what the players today are representing and seeing them stand up for what they think is right is, um, you know, is just another great reason to support this incredible organization. So thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely, Bill, absolutely. And, and you mentioned Kia Clark over here that CEO of the Liberty. Um, it's important, yes, a round of applause for Kia. Her and her team did an amazing job. And I wanted to highlight just Kia because you talk about the change. A lot of fans that were in here were at the beginning at the Garden. They remember those days. And now you transition. The team is still here, it's still your team, and now it's in Brooklyn. How important is it to have great ownership, people that are working behind the scenes to keep growing the WNBA and growing this team? Well, it's, it's no different for the WNBA than it is for the NBA or any other league here. And um, I know Key and I have talked about the incredible support that the Psy family is providing, um, this great home in Brooklyn. This is a first class arena. Um, it just, you know, it's just a truth. I mean, it just takes a lot of work and effort to make a, uh, a pro team successful just a lot of ingredients here. Um, but it seems to me from what everything I can tell, the commitment is there. Uh, the expertise, you know, you have to have people that know what they're doing. And um, again, you know, I just sort of keep sending it back to the players. I mean, to have players who are so engaging with the fans, who 
are so, art, they're artists on the court, really make all of this possible. So it seems like they've got everything they need here, Swin, to keep it going and keep it growing. Well, let's take it back to, to the early days. Sue, give me a memory you got from that first season with the Liberty. First of all, I'm so happy to be here and so many familiar faces. Um, we're a little bit older. <laughs> Sue, 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 we're, we're not old. Here. We're not old, Sue, we're seasoned. <laughs> there you go, there you go. And you're still here. You're still here, that, that passion. So I'm just going to say that about the fans. Our first interaction, I was doing a, some documentary, some filming that we've all been involved with, and they asked me about the Liberty fans, because they asked first about the first game, and that was spectacular, amazing. But what about when you came back to New York for the first game, the first game in Madison Square Garden, and that arena was teeming with energy, and not just little girls, but big girls that were the same age that I am now, that are Miko's age, Spoon's age, that had tears in their eyes, that they could buy a jersey with a woman's name on the back, that they could cheer, and that we had time to stop and listen to hear that story. Their dream was the dream that we had the opportunity to do. That is my memory. Like, that's the, the most poignant memory I have, is that generation that missed it and all the humility that a Val has. She missed playing in the league, but she created the league. And she'll say always the um, accolades, the credit to everyone else, but Val was an amazing commissioner. Amazing commissioner, because she was generous with everything, gave it to everyone else, and created these things. So you're always in my heart, Val, for that, your humility. And I always want to be as humble as you, but it's impossible because I cannot be. I always want to raise my hands up and say, look at me. But you never do that. So my most poignant memory is that moment in New York City when you embraced us and we had a home. Country girls like Miko, Spoon, Kim became New Yorkers immediately and embodied all the things that are great about New York. Um, that was my moment that of memory that's the most beautiful, connecting with you and the energy that you gave to us and took from us back and forth, back and forth. It was a beautiful, beautiful moment in time. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for sharing that. And Kim, I'm going to jump over to you because Sue made a great point about you all were here and you became New Yorkers. And you stayed. You've been here. Take us back to that inaugural season. Take us back to that first game. What memories come up right away for you? The actual first game in LA? Yes. Wow. Um, well, me, coming into this league, I was a true veteran. I was 35 at the time, getting ready to turn 36, and had been playing abroad for like 12 years. And I, I figured that the WNBA would eventually happen, but I just didn't think that I would ever be a part of it. Um, so when I was a part of it and it happened, and we were actually in the Great Western Forum out in Los Angeles, I couldn't help but tear up and just in wonder that we were about to make history. And it, we were gonna be, make history for girls, for all of the women, Val, Carol Blazjowski, so many women that could not play professionally or their leagues didn't last as long, or did, leagues didn't last. But this was the first time that we had a choice to go overseas. I just felt so honored and I felt so proud. But I, like I always say, I was on an emotional roller coaster that day because one moment we were hyped to play, like, yeah, with Spoon, like, come on, let's go. And then the next minute we were nervous because we were going to be on national television and everyone would be watching, you know, and everything. But for me, what stood out the most was the fact that we were a part of history and now we are celebrating 25 years. So that is, has just been a true blessing. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Kim. 
Wig, I'm gonna come on down there to you because you had an opportunity to, to hear that you were now going to come and play in New York City with Sue, with Kim, with Spoon. What was going through your mind, not only coming and playing with these great players in this iconic place, but also the fan base? Because I know you had to be thinking about that too. To be honest with you, Swan, it scared the hell out of me. Um, <laughs> The first thing that went through my mind was like, New York, really? Um, I, I looked at my mom and I was like, how am I going, how do you hail a cab? I don't even know how to do that. But um, once I arrived, it, it felt like I had been here all along. Um, that first pickup game we had, to Spoon walking in and I'm stretching on the floor and I'm saying in my head like, oh my God, that's Teresa Weatherspoon, that's Kim Hampton, because I knew everybody on the team. Like, I did my research, looked at their background and everything, and I'm all excited inside, but they'll tell you I never said a word. <laughs> so, but um, I was in a unique situation because at my first game, Rebecca got hurt, and I was just kind of thrown into the fire, but, um. I was always kind of raised to be that person that wished somebody would and not, <laughs> never be ready. So I, I was ready. They were ready. And, and, and just to add on top of that, uh, with, what was it like playing on the floor? Is there, there's just something different that's magical with the fans that are here, the energy that they give you. They talk about the six man all the time, but what was different with New York? The thing that's different with New York is that if you suck, they're gonna let you know. Um, oh, y'all laughing now, huh? Y'all laughing. Y'all like laughing. Huh? I appreciate that though, because it, it makes you it makes you want to be better. It makes you be on your A game all the time. You don't want to be booed at home, but um, I, I mean, if we were sucking it up, they let us know, and that's when you knew. Okay, we gotta some gotta change. We gotta pick it up. So you, you grow to appreciate that. And after a while, you know, I'm like, oh, these people aren't so bad. So, <laughs> you know, it, was just, it just kind of felt like home. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Wit. All right, let, let's jump into some of this memorabilia behind us. Yeah, give it up for Wit. Uh, Matt, I'm going to come to you in both Bovell, because I know behind us we have uh, the Liberty warm-up jacket and short... Uh, shooting shirt, actually. We have the original there. We have the New York Liberty practice jersey, signed members of the first team uh, that are on there. And we also have Rebecca Lobo, Teresa Witherspoon, both of their jerseys, and Rebecca's Reebok footwear. I think we have Sue's jersey back there in the 1997 WNBA Finals jersey. Um, and just some other, some other things, miscellaneous basketballs and stuff like that. But why is it so important to make sure we preserve not only the history of the game, Matt, but also the swag, what they're wearing? The, you know, these are the first uniforms we're seeing back here. Why is it so important for, for the hall to be able to, to keep these uh, memorabilia and things like that alive? Well, uh, I, I don't know that I can answer it specifically, but um, I, think, I think anything sports or otherwise, if we get that perspective, um, you know, have a sense of where we were and where we're going, uh, it will help. Um, so the preservation of, of where we were, um, uh, you know, seeing the, the game evolve over not just the last 25 years, but really the last 125 years. Um, and I would say uh, uh, in the last 50 years, uh, since I guess 72, right, in particular, um, the opportunity for women uh, to uh, play, participate, compete, um, and not <clears throat> uh, uh, not feel like other or, or, or so not included or something like that, uh, I think is pretty special. And I think someone mentioned it. There were other leagues, mm -hmm. but they just didn't have staying power. Mm -hmm. And so 25 years, um, there's, there's a lot that, that doesn't have that kind of staying power. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if we talk specifically, I mean, uh, you know, any, you, this would be the origins, I think, for, yeah. at least for the Liberty, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and Val, how difficult was it when you talk about designing the first jerseys, the look, the feel of what it's going to be? Now, it has evolved over the years. We've had some hit or misses, we all know. <laughs> but throughout, 
how important is it to just really get the play? I feel like now even more the players' input and to the culture of the jerseys. Back then, what was the initial thoughts of designing the jersey? Well, let me maybe start, Swin, with the name. I mean, when we started the league, as everyone probably remembers, uh, all of the teams were kind of linked to NBA teams in those cities, right? So we had, you know, we were in New York, and, and we were, you know, the team was connected with the Knicks in Los Angeles. They were connected with the Lakers and so on. And one of the ideas was to come up with a name that was sort of tied to the NBA name, where it made sense. Interestingly, the two places where we couldn't come up with anything that linked to the NBA name were New York and Los Angeles. So LA, we just, you know, Johnny Buss just came up with the sparks. Mm -hmm. It just, he liked it. So, and then here in New York, we couldn't think of anything that related to the Knickerbockers. I mean, it's like, you know, it's just sort of unto itself as a name. So what do we do? We came up with a name. This is the most iconic woman in the city of New York. It's the Statue of Liberty. That's what that was all about. It was Lady Liberty. And so why not, you know, turn that into the name? So that's why the, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the, the name and the, the, um, the logo kind of came to look that way. So that was sort of one part of it. And then there was an effort when early, uh, we were working with Nike was our first uniform supplier. And there was an effort to come up with uniforms that at that time, had the sort of most up-to-date kind of fabric, you know, that was, I don't know, you guys tell me, Spoon, tell me, I mean, was it comfy? Were those uniforms early on comfy at all? I hope they were a little bit comfortable. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that was, there was a thinking behind trying to make it modern, and I don't know what the word is. Um, I don't know, Sue, was it wickability? I don't know. It just sort of wicks away perspiration or something. But there, there, there was something to that. And then this green, last thing I'll say is the green was sort of the patina green. I see it on hats still in the building here. That was, again, back to the Statue of Liberty and that, that green color that she's acquired over many years. So there was some, yeah, seafoam, exactly. So I know that's still kind of in the, uh, in the marketing plans today. So there was thinking behind a lot of that. Yes, and, and I love the fact even when the team was moved here to Brooklyn that that seafoam stayed with the team. So that was a great call. Uh, there, Kia, as well. Matt, I want to come back to you because I know a lot of fans in here have been collecting, whether it's autograph, different memorabilia, and some of them may not even know they have things that hold value. Can you just give us a couple examples of things that may hold value right now if you're a collector? Well, I think, um, first of all, if you're, if you're collecting, I think let it be personal to yourself rather than it being just market value later. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it'll always, ha always have more meaning. So, uh, if, if someone autographs something for you, you know, be there for the experience rather than buying it on eBay or something like that later. It, it, it won't click as much for yourself. But um, I think anything game worn is just really cool because, you know, object in itself holds value, whether it's uh, the intrinsic value of it or the value that you've associated with it. So, um, there's a there's a historical value to the things that. Uh, you've collected over the years. Putting a, uh, uh, an appraisal value on it, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing anyway, but I, I think it's more important, you know, what, what do these things hold for you? What were you thinking at those moments, going through at those moments? You know, what are the things that you've held on to that were meaningful for you? Um, so, it, so if you make it personal, it's going to, that's, that's where it's re really meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and I know a lot of you over the years, um, and, I, and I say this because I, there was one trading card that I had never seen in my life the whole time I was playing, and somebody came up and asked me to sign it, and I was like, where'd you get that from? <laughs> um, but you really, I mean, you guys have experienced, because we're a lot of times just living through it. You're going season to season, you're playing through it, and we don't see stuff on the other side, and it's really cool to know that people were out there following your game, they care about how you played the game, collecting uh, different things. And so uh, the fan had told me, well, I have an extra one, I'll give it to you. And like, that was pretty special for me because I have two young boys. Um, so that holds a lot of value to me because I want them to be able to grow up. They won't see mommy play unless it's on YouTube. Uh, and it's probably gonna be blurred, <laughs> grainy by then. But uh, you know, it, it's, it's just something that, that you can hold dear to your heart. But Sue, so I'm gonna jump back over there to you. And can you put into perspective kind of where we are right now with the game um, after 25 years and what you see from maybe this young team, the Liberty team, and, and, and where 
the game can continue to grow in what areas? That's a great question. So I am blown away with the talent, the different t level of talent that we have now. Um, every player watches the game and we're wondering, can we still play? I don't care who you are, you're watching. I wonder if I could guard her. I wonder if I could, you know, in my prime, of course. And I think the elite, the best, um, will always play because they're going to play with their heart and they're going to compete. But from 97 to 25 years later, there's no comparison. The women's basketball has exploded. The moves that the girls are making, the, um, the plays out of this world and blown away with the development of talent. Um, and another thing that's occurred gradually, slowly, is there's a new breed of woman. And I don't think I'm being hyperbolic about that. The woman that I see now on the court has the ability to speak. And if you think that's a small thing, grow up in sports when you're afraid to say that the weight room is not adequate or you're going to be fired for that. Or that this, this is not okay that the way you're covering me and asking about my husband or what my brother does. Those different things and that the women don't just answer the question, they say, wait a second, let me speak to you about this. That blows me away. That is the change, the, the shift in society that I see these women on the front of. And you're going to see it in sports because of that self-assurance that you have to have as an athlete, that knowing who you are over time and believing in yourself that you get from sports. So we grew up, Spoon, Kimmy, we grew up in a different generation. We were so happy to be here. We were just pleased as punch to be here. And so many of the other things just didn't matter. We had that one opportunity. We we're going to make it the most out of it. We're going to take that as far as we can. And my colleagues certainly have. They're borderline going to be the next NBA um, head coach. Woo! Swim. <laughs> One day, I will not just be the WNBA commissioner, she will be the commissioner of the NBA. This is the type of person that is sitting down there. These dreams, these ideas, I don't know if they were happening in our heads then. We were like, oh my gosh, I'm going to play, and this is amazing. Now the next generation and growing up through it, grabbing every opportunity. Spoon is the person that always says, oh, I'm going to ride this to the wheels fall off. I'm going to ride this to the wheels fall off. She's not kidding. She is, until she gets what she wants. And now these other women are dreaming bigger dreams. So I think that we're part of that, a little foundation. But I'm blown away by the women that are in this league, their messaging that they do, out, um, how they speak, the different franchises, Kia, your, um, your work here in New York and the WNBA, NBA on the whole, the social justice movement, speaking. I look at the television and then when I see that, I like do my eyes like that. I cannot believe that this is possible in 25 years. Um, I feel like definitely, definitely a grandma, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> look at these <laughs> girls. So the game has been elevated. There's a new level of player. There is a new swag out there. That's always been there, but it's broader and deeper. And now I see a shift in women and how they use their voices, their experience. For the most part, we're always going to be a little bit of the outside of the norm because we're women, because the majority of our league is black. We have a different perspective, and when you hear that, I think it changes the way everybody thinks about themselves. So I'm just blown away with this league and what we've accomplished and what these young women are doing today. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sue, because <clears throat> I can recall back probably six years ago uh, before this last CBA, and I remember us going through the whole process and throughout my career, it's two CBAs that I, negotiations I had to go through. The last one before I retired was very, very difficult. 
And because we were at a point in the league where a lot of the women were making a lot of money overseas, they were getting tired, it felt like we were in a constant loop, a lot of change wasn't happening. And I remember our executive committee with the union, we kept saying there's the apathy within our league, we're not united, we're not there, we don't feel like this is going to continue. And I remember having tears one time, having a conversation with Tamika Ketchings, and I said, Meek, I said, this CBA is not what we want. We deserve better, but we have to figure out a way to get to the other side, because the next CBA, we have to believe that the women will be strong enough, united enough, to be able to do what it takes. So you make a sacrifice. We made a, we made a sacrifice then to make sure that we could have legs to keep moving. You guys made a sacrifice early on through one CBA to keep it moving. And now you see this last CBA, what they were able to stand united as 144 and what they were able to accomplish. The first time to be able to get to a point where you have you know, maternity leave that is something that is there that you're negotiating with. We're a women's league, you know? You're negotiating, you have all these different things now that are in the CBA, better pay. A lot of times, what you all don't see is the sacrifice that is made by Spoon, it's made by Wit, it's made by Sue, it's made by Kim. A lot of times, these are the women that are knocking on the door that they never walk through. Well, I guarantee you this, the last CBA, a lot of women that are out there playing now walk through that door because they have better situation than we had back in the day. So that sacrifice is made. So you guys continue to keep supporting because it's needed. But this younger generation right now, oh, they understand. Their voice is powerful. Their voice is united and it's powerful. And it's fun to watch as a fan now. I hope it's fun for you all to watch this team um, and watch the league as a whole because it is going in the right direction. So thank you for sharing that, Kim. I mean, Sue, sorry. I said Kim because I want to go to Kim next because I, wanted, I want you just to talk about quickly, Kim, how you have a young daughter and you're getting to see through her eyes now of what the league means and what it means to her and how it could be you know, a destination for her in the future. What are those conversations like when you bring her to a game and she's interacting with the fans? Because literally all the fans have watched her grow up. <laughs> that is so true. Do you guys remember? She was two days old and I was carrying her in my arms like that. Uh, it's been a complete joy to have her around. Um, the sisterhood that I built with, with these young ladies and, and then after I stopped playing uh, to be able to watch the growth of the league, um, it, it was something that I knew I wanted my daughter to be exposed to, um, the fan base. So you got, it felt like family here always and there was not a day if we, you saw us anywhere, you guys always greeted us with warmth and love and, and for that we greatly appreciate that. So I wanted my daughter to see that. And, um, you know, she has a lot of aunts <laughs> and some uncles in the NBA. Um, we're all constantly trying to guide them and lead them. Um, and, and, and hopefully that they would become fans of this league and to take from this league to see what it takes to get to the next level. Because for me, sports and athletics is more than just a game. You know, I look back over my life and all of us, we had an opportunity to um, get a free education, to travel the world doing what we love to do, and to get paid to do it. To, an opportunity to play with some of the best players in the world and against some of the best players in the world. An opportunity to be a part of something new for us and now something that is 25 years in existence. So for me, trying to guide her, and she, she is uh, quite a basketball player, and, and as we think about the colleges and the schools that she wants to go and participate in, like for me, it's just been really, really important to have her here and to have her present to see because this, I mean, it doesn't get any better. So for me, the connection is big. But on the, on the flip side of that, I'm, I'm, I'm a little heartbroken because there's a disconnect between youth basketball, girls, youth basketball, and collegiate ball, and as well as the WNBA. I mean, they're playing all of this AAU ball during the summer, but these kids need to be in these arenas, and they need to see. If you want to get to the next level, you need to see what the next level looks like. I mean, we go into schools and ask, okay, name three players on the New York Liberty and crickets. But if I said name three players on the Knicks or on any other NBA team, people would be able to spew out names. And so I feel that with that, we need to somehow come up with a way, a better way to make, a, make the connection stronger. Yeah, that's a great point, Kim. That's a great point. So Val, I'll throw that over to you because you've seen from the inception to now and now being um, at the conference, at the Big East, 
Uh, how do we get to that point? How do we make that connection uh, from the grassroots level to the collegiate level and then the WNBA? Well, I, you know, I've long thought, Swin, that there, there should be, must be, sort of greater, like a better sort of, um, sort of collaboration between women's college basketball, which plays in the, you know, winter months and the WNBA in the summer. It just, you've got a year-round opportunity, you know, to cross-promote and talk about all these great players that have been to, you know, great college programs like all of you and what they're doing at the next level. So there have been a lot of discussions about that over the years. I, you know, they, not enough's been done. It's sort of a longish story. But I think more, more could be done there. I think, frankly, um, you know, one big difference between what we had or didn't have then and now is social media. And, you know, Sue, you alluded to it with the reports that came, the bad reports came out of the Women's National Tournament in March that were sort of made, you know, brought to light because of social media. We didn't have it when the league launched. So we didn't have it for our purposes. You all didn't have it for your purposes. But now you do. We all do. And so there is, I think, um, room for women's basketball to grow, you know, to t take an advantage of this technology. TV remains really important. I mean, and I think I just want to give an odd to, you know, colleagues at ESPN especially because they've been covering women's basketball from the beginning. They did the national team in 95. They did the WNBA launch. Um, they've been doing women's college basketball. The final four is, you know, is, gets great ratings. We see these great teams. So, you know, they take their knocks, but they've done a lot, you know, for women's basketball. And I think to continue to have that platform to tell the stories of, you know, all of you and your successors is um, part of the, uh, you know, part of the, the magic here. But, you know, the games uh, sell themselves. They're great entertainment. And I'm, you know, I'm with you, Kim. We got to make sure that basketball fans no, not just who the men's players are, but who the women's players are. I mean, that's got to happen, and I'm sure it will. But you're, you're right. You're spot on. I just, I just want to follow up on that. Do you think, I know there's been talk, and I get asked this question all the time. Now that the money's higher, now that we're paying the women a little bit more, is it, should we start look at changing the season? And I know you're not commissioner <laughs> right now, but is that something that you think, should possibly be looked at? Was it something you looked at back in the day when you were also running the league? Well, uh, you know, I will say for the fans here, this was, um, it was never anything but the summer. I mean, mm -hmm. this was what worked for the NBA. They wanted, um, they wanted to make sure, they wanted to make sure that the WNBA would have its own sort of space. And there was a nervousness that if the league was playing in the winter, they'd be up against all the other sports that take up TV, that take up fan you know, interest. So the thinking was summer is just not as busy. So that was the launch. You're right, Swin. That was the launch decision. That's where the TV was. You guys remember, we had the three networks. We had right. NBC, we had Lifetime, we had ESPN. That would not have been possible if we were playing from October to February. It just right. wouldn't have happened. We would have been playing at three in the morning to get on those t networks. So that was the decision then. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, to your point, I've been gone now a while, but it is interesting the league is stuck to that frame, time frame. I remember, you know, at times having sort of musings about, wow, you know, summer sometimes is rough. People go on vacation. They're not buying a full season ticket, Kia, because they're like taking three-week vacation, so they don't want the full plan. So there was some talk about, well, maybe, you know, maybe what if the season started in like April? Um, you know, after the college season ended and went through September and you added the months and you stretched out the games and would that work? But I had to deal with the, the playoffs of the hockey and the NBA teams. Right. So Kim is noting the scheduling conflicts with the other leagues. And importantly, I think one, a last thing I'll say is, you know, one benefit of the summer was it did give the players, you all, the chance to play overseas in the winter if you wanted. And by the way, just so just to make the you know set the record straight on the ABL, you guys remember this? We said you guys could play in the ABL in the winter if you wanted. Our contracts were non-exclusive. The ABL contracts were exclusive. They did not want their players playing in the WNBA, and we said no. We don't. That would be great if players want to play in the winter, whether ABL or Europe. We said that's fine. We just want the players to have the opportunities. So um, now you got Europe. You know, players going back and forth still, as one of you noted. 
And so I think, the, you know, you, you said it well, Swin. I think these are the kinds of discussions that really are meaningful in bargaining. I mean, that's where the player input on season length, season start, season ending. I mean, that's, you know, uh, you know, and Key has been part of that, I know. But that's, I think it's an evolution. It may well be that someday it's a, it's a different season. Right now it seems like, you know, people are still deciding that that still works best from the business standpoint. But it could always change. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. I was today years old when I when I learned that you had the option to play in the WNBA and ABL. <laughs> Learn something new every day, ladies and gentlemen. I did not know that. That's that's interesting. That's a good that's a good point there, uh, Val. Wait, I'm gonna come down there to you because you told me you were scared as hell to come here to New York. What? Give me a story because she's over there trying to hide in the corner right now. What was your introduction to? Teaspoon, but it has to be PG. Go. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, my introduction to Spoon, she came in the, in the gym, I was stretching, and she said, oh, we got us a red bone. Hey, that yellow bone. <laughs> so I just waved my hand, and uh, her and Kim were picking teams. We were playing pickup, and Spoon picked me on her team. Never played with her, just watched her. And I looked at her, she looked at me, and I spent off of who was guarding me. She threw a lob to the rim, and I caught it and finished the reverse on the other side. And she said, oh, we got somebody who can play. <laughs> and that was the biggest compliment I can say that, that meant the world to me over my whole basketball career, was that Teresa Weatherspoon said that I could play. <laughs> I love it, I love it. But why, Miko? Why? <laughs> and Swin, when I would give you those elbows and other people those elbows and things like that, it's mostly because I would ask my teammates who did it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and she would get them all, oh, baby. So I was just going to go get do a get back for my teammates, and here's Kim. She'd be like, Miko, why? And I'd just be like, now, now, now you know they was up there telling a the story. I am the smallest one out there, skinniest out ever. But, I just had a couple elbows out here. They a little sharp. That was not me. It wasn't your elbows, when It was your knees, cause your knees came oh, up yeah, so I didn't have high. Knees. <laughs> I was like, this kid got Wait, the why longest. Why you telling everybody's business? I said, I said this kid got the longest legs ever. <laughs> Oh, so I'm gonna come to you. If somebody wanted to come, a free agent, they wanted to come play here in Brooklyn for the New York Liberty, what are you gonna tell them they have to bring to be a New York Liberty player? What makes you a New York Liberty player? Before I answer that, uh -huh. we were playing Detroit and uh, Crystal Robinson never complains, never says anything, but is one of the best defensive players in the whole league. But you know her from that quick release. I remember she came back in the huddle and she was all flustered and um, she was like, I got my hands full out there with Swin Cash. <laughs> and for her to say that, she never says anything, but she was like looking around, where's my help, where's my back, you know, somebody please help me. And I always wanted to guard three players, that swing position. And I just like started looking on the ground and stuff because she needed some help and a switch. And I just started checking my shoes and stuff. I wanted no part of that. So that is why you got the elbows. Okay, that's, that's a compliment. A, so y'all just out there just double triple team people, huh? Y'all just taking me out on this little stretcher, huh? Little rook out there. Okay, I see what it is. I love y'all though. I love y'all. <laughs> I think coming to New York, New York um, is really about passion. They fall in love with players that have passion. Um, Benaja Laney, that is a New York player. I mean, she's played, what, a half a season? Who here loves Benaja? <laughs> when I watch her, she certainly, um, for me, I would say MVP, not because she's up there with the super elites, and there's like three or four of them, but she is playing optimal basketball, the best basketball in this league, top of their talent, potential, um, inside of a team concept. 
Laney is it for me. That is a New York player. When I talk to my teammates, that's the first thing they say. There's a, there are a lot of great players on this team. Laney, number one. We want her on our team. Like, we're always drafting back to 97. That is a New York player. Um, Sammy, all passion, jumping up and down. When I see that energy, that reminds me of a spoon. Not only giving you 100%, but you know what? Let me be a cheerleader for a couple of minutes, and I'm going to cheerlead over here for another 20%. So that giving everything you have is um, a great quality to have in New York because that is... New York is a special city. We took some knocks, I'll tell you what, this last year. And we, you know, a lot of people had a hard time in New York City. Is New York City ever coming back? That question, and I've said, when I would hear this, I was like, are you, this is New York. It's coming back. This is, we're, we're New Yorkers. There's an energy center here and it's something special. So when you come here and you bring what these young players are bringing, Lainey, Sammy, that's special. When you come here and your Spoon and Miko and Kimmy, you become New Yorkers forever. The qualities that um, my teammates, my New York teammates brought, and they sometimes, I don't, I don't think it's um, not a compliment. They were very country. And because Miko used to say to me all the time, you think I'm country, don't you? And I would be like, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> But that smart country, like she would do it, she does everything like, oh, I'm so country, I don't know what's going on. Blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden you're laying on the ground, you got a bloody nose, and then she scored the basket, her and Spoon are high five. I was like, what? And she was like, oh, I'm so happy and proud of myself being here with you. And then again, score. I was the player that she spun off of and scored, and just so you know, that's who, who she scored on. So those type of qualities, I think um, New York is about not just being number one, but more importantly, striving to be number one. This is a striving, aspirational city that is about the grind and the hustle. And this New York Liberty team currently, I don't think our wins match what I see in the DNA on this team. This team, when Natasha Howard is playing full, I think Inescu will play much better with her when we get a little more movement in the interior. We have all the stuff on the perimeter through a lot of ups and downs. They stick together, and that is a quality that is the most admirable. We've had seasons when I played with Spoon. We were, we were looking at going, being in last place, but never once did we talk, not talk about going to the finals and winning a championship? It didn't matter how many wins and losses we had. At the end of this, let me tell you where we're going. And I feel that with this Liberty team. I feel that they stick together, and I know they took some hard losses, but this team is a winning team, and it, it, it will win because they have the personality, they have the character to do that, and that is a New York team. Kim, what's, a, what's, a what's the mentality you have to have to play in this city, on this team? You have to have thick skin, and you have to have a tough mentality. I mean, I, I feel that New York fans are the, the, the smartest fans. They're, the, they're, they're just intelligent fans, and they can see through anything. They can see a player that's coming and making excuses and full of fluff. And you know, if you just get a big contract, oh, you're you're gonna get, you're not gonna have a great career. I don't care if it's baseball, hockey. I don't care what it is. If you don't bring it when you come in, uh, you, you you just you're just not gonna make it here. The media is gonna eat you alive. So you have to have extremely thick skin. But the but again, like Sue said, you have to come and be ready to play. You guys were just as happy if we lost, but we fought a team tooth and nail. You guys were standing up cheering for us. It was like, okay, they just happened to hit a couple extra shots. Okay, that, that's good, but we're good with that. So you, if you're going to come and play here, you have to have a strong mentality because sometimes it's not just the media. It's not the fans. You know, it is, it's, it's like a pressure. It, it's like when you play in Madison Square Garden. There's no other arena like Madison Square Garden. There's something about the lights. It's something about the energy. It's it's just something. And I don't care if it's a brand new arena. It's just it's still something about the garden. So, it's a whole lot of ghosts and things like that. So that you have to work through too. <laughs> no, but you have to really have a tough. You have to have thick skin, a tough mentality. 
quickly for me, Val, why is it so important for not to just preserve the history of the game through what players are wearing, the memorabilia, but also making sure we connect the legends to the younger players? Why is that so important for this league to continue to grow? You. Yep. Um, well, I, I mean, just... I, you know, you're asking sort of somebody who really is a believer in history, Swin. I mean, I really, I'm really respectful of, of history. Um, knowing, I, I think we're, you know, we're better when we know sort of how things unfolded, where things, how things got started. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're better citizens in our country if we know sort of the history of, of you know, how things came to be. And so I think in the sports world, um, it's, it's as important. And I'm, I'm really grateful that there is so much interest in the 25th anniversary of the WNBA. And there is this moment to look back and to talk about where, you know, where we were as, um, as a country, as a society, where we were with women, where we were with women's team sports 25 years ago. It's um, a good way to make comparisons, but also to sort of um, inspire us about what, you know, what happens next. So I do hope, it's interesting, I mean, I, I just, I do, I still do a lot of interview requests for the league, which I'm flattered by. I can't tell you, I, you know, how many young people um, will interview me and they'll say to me, you know, I, um, I grew up watching the league. I, w I remember I was, you know, five years old or 10 years old and we had the, you know, games on television and they would talk about, these are young boys, not just young girls talking about what an impression all of you made on them, what it, you know, what it did to them. I mean, it sort of made them like egalitarian, practically, in terms of how they feel about women. And so when I hear that, it's just, it is sobering. We, Kim said it well, like you don't realize you were part of history back then. You know, but when you hear these reflections from people who grew up on this, um, you know, it is, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. So. You know, again, I'm glad that the Liberty are doing this. Thanks again to Kia for putting this program together. And I do hope we can continue these conversations, not just on anniversaries, but sort of continuously. Absolutely. And Matt, uh, can you quickly just tell us why it's so important for the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame to have the collector items, but at the same time, how do you guys continue to keep it going and keep the hall open? Uh, is it through donations? Is it through people who have things, uh, lending them to the, to the hall to be able sure. to put on display? Yeah, yeah, so we're, we're a, uh, you know, we're just up the road too. If anybody wants to come up and visit, it's about two and a half hours away, so we would welcome that. Uh, we're a brand new facility, but um, we've got over 40,000 uh, 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 historical objects in our collection. Uh, we work exclusively on donations, so the generosity of, of uh, fans, the generosity of organizations like the Big East or the WNBA, uh, and um, I think that uh, uh, the opportunity to show a 25th anniversary of, of this of the WNBA, but um, just to, you know, there was what came before. Um, that will help. Uh, anyone gain an appreciation for uh, where they are now. And I'll mention uh, Val, because I don't know the whole story, but you know, Val played at Virginia, I believe, and under a great coach, Debbie Ryan, maybe. Um, and Val played overseas, I think, just maybe one or two seasons. But so when you think about that, talk about just, just right, right here, besides the Liberty um, legends, uh, we got it right here, and not just at the uh, administrative level or, or commissioner level, um, she had game also. So, <laughs> I, 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 Bell got game. I, I would disagree, but uh, but there's no footage, so how would we know, right? So yeah. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for being on this panel. I just want to briefly close by no, give a big round of applause, please, for everybody. Wait, Sue, Matt, Val, and also Kim. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Kia, your whole team, thank you for having this panel. I, I just want to say this to you all. 25 years, when I came into the WNBA, the one, of the, thing, the one thing that I was most excited about was having the ability to come and play against teams like New York, to play against teams like Houston. And that was because my senior year in high school, I was able to see the WNBA. I was able to see it. And a young lady walked up to me today 
that's from my hometown area and talked about how she's been doing, interviewing different players throughout and visited every WNBA arena, correct? The WNBA is so important because it's not for our generation, it's for every other young generation that's coming after us. I had an NBA player that played for our team that said to me, they had a poster up of Sue and I and the UConn team when they were in college. Like, you guys were so dope, this, that, the other. Those are the moments when you know we're moving the needle because people are paying attention. The New York Liberty is so important. They're an icon franchise. The fans are so important because you keep it 100, as Spoon always say. Make sure you continue to give the legends love, support the current team, support the WNBA, and let's keep this thing moving. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.